Hey, everybody. Uh, I am David Gordon. Um, I'm part of the uh, AAEM Critical Care Medicine Section Board. And welcome to the AAEM Critical Care Medicine Section Reveloquent Junior Speaker Program. It's a whole mouthful, but I think I got it all out in the right order. Thanks, June. Um, uh, I appreciate it. I'm David Gordon. I will be moderating tonight's session um, on behalf of the Critical Care Medicine Section. And we're really excited that all of you are taking time uh, to join us tonight. I know that everyone's busy. If you're a med student, resident, attending, whoever you are, you all have stuff today, but I'm glad you decided to spend at least a little bit of time tonight with us. Uh, tonight's webinar is gonna be recorded as you may or may not have just heard. Um, and it's gonna be uploaded to the CCMS website in the next 48 hours. So if you have any questions, thoughts, you wanna hear that talk again, uh, you wanna refer someone else to the talk, you should be able to do that. If you have any questions during tonight, uh, during the talks, you can use the chat box to put those questions there. And we'll make sure to revisit those at the end of the talk. And we'll have some time at the end of every talk to make sure that you guys get your questions answered. Does anyone have any questions so far? All right, I see a blank chat box and a lot of heads shaking. No, that's a good sign. Uh, so we have five awesome talks tonight. Uh, first from Matt Stample talking about uh, paralysis with awareness. Next up will be Andrew Lin talking about target temperature management um, in an overview and an update, especially with all the big changes that have come out recently. Uh, Andrew Lin, oh, sorry. Next will be Brian Frody talking about the pragmatic hepatic schematic about acute liver failure in the emergency department. Then Matthew Carby, figure, uh, curbside to critical care in retrieval medicine. And lastly, uh, David Leon will bring us home fresh off a shift uh, talking about vasopressin for trauma and hemorrhagic shock. Uh, any questions about those things? Awesome. So first up will be Dr. Stample talking about paralysis uh, with awareness. And I believe he is straight uh, from Jordan, from his honeymoon, giving us uh, an update. So thanks, Matt. The floor is yours. Thank you. So yeah, I'm Matthew Stample. I'm a emergency medicine PGY3 at the University of Wisconsin. And probably more interestingly than that, um, I'm going to be a med flight fellow at UW next year and planning to do critical care after that. And then as Dr. Gordon alluded to, I'm currently presenting from a hotel hallway in Jordan. So if my uh, lights cut out in the middle, I'll have to stand up and jig the motion sensor here. So, all right, let's get going. So I want to first talk about what inspired me to give this talk. So of course, it's a med flight story. Um, so I was riding along on med flight um, earlier this year and med flight was called out for a motorcycle crash and a patient had not been wearing a helmet and crashed his motorcycle and skidded his face across quite a lot of gravel and really tore up the front of his face. I've got a picture here on the slide that, you know, looks terrible. Um, his face is actually maybe a little bit worse. Um, it was less of the cheek and more of the mouth itself, but he came with the GCS at 15 to that outside hospital and, um, when, when he got there, they were very organized. They got anesthesia down. They intubated him, secured the airway. Um, they intubated him with a Tomadin and rock, but he only got two milligrams midazolam for sedation. And then we got there 30 minutes later, and he's super hypertensive. And even though he's not moving because he's still paralyzed, we, we were a little bit horrified that they hadn't done more to sedate this guy who has this complete, like open face, intubated, other, other bad injuries. Um, and got, got me thinking more and more about the harms of paralysis with awareness. So to share a quote from the ED awareness study, which we'll talk about a little bit later, I just want to put this up here. I'm not going to read it off to you. But I, want to, I want to give you a moment just to, for people to look at these words on here for a patient's experience who went through paralysis with awareness. So. All right, and then I'm moving on to the next slide here. So what are the harms of awareness of paralysis. As you can see from that quote in the story I was sharing, it's an extremely unpleasant experience for patients, but more than that, it also increases the risk for future psychologic problems. You know, we've been talking more and more in recent years about kind of post ICU problems. Um, and this is definitely something that could contribute to that in a major way. So up to 70% of patients who experience awareness of paralysis will have PTSD, major depression, complex phobia, or other problems um, after surviving the experience. Now, how common is this? Like, is, is this something that we really need to worry about? Is it, is it like a once in the blue moon kind of thing? 
So it's been well studied in the OR setting. So 0.1% of 0.2% of patients undergoing general anesthesia who are paralyzed can have awareness of paralysis. So on this slide here, I've got a thousand dots printed out and I've got one circle to help kind of visually represent like what 0.1% looks like. Um, now, if we move to um, a higher risk cohort of patients who are only getting IV anesthesia, that comes up to 1% of patients who will be aware of paralysis. And here you can see, now we've got 10 of these thousand dots that are circled. But what makes a patient high risk? What, what, what is this population where we need to be more worried about this? So IV anesthesia is part of it. Underdosing anesthesia is another piece. Longer acting neuromuscular blockade like rocuronium can contribute. And then also a lack of protocol sedation depth monitoring. And all of these things apply in the emergency department. And to a lesser extent, the patients can also be at risk for them in the ICU as well. So how common is awareness of paralysis in our setting, in the ED and the ICU? You know, what is that number? How many, how many of these thousand dots are going to be circled? So a meta-analysis done last year looked to answer that question. Um, so looking through the available literature, they found seven studies with just over 900 patients. Um, the overall estimate of awareness with paralysis in this was 12.3%. Now, this is almost certainly an overestimate. Um, when they were doing this, a lot of the studies were very poor quality and they used some really variable survey tools. Kind of the gold standard for um, assessing awareness with paralysis from patient um, recall is this modified Bryce questionnaire. I've got the questions up here. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but the key question is kind of that one in the middle there. So when they're asking, do you, when they're asking patients who recovered from this event, like, do you remember anything between losing consciousness and waking up again? And, and then kind of in interrogating those answers. Um, so in this meta-analysis, when they limit to that modified Bryce questionnaire, there's an awareness rate of 1.9%. And then if they limit the analysis to good quality studies, including ones that didn't necessarily use the modified Bryce, they had an awareness rate of 3.4%. And the takeaway from all this is with our current evidence, we don't know what the rate of awareness with paralysis in the ED and the ICU is at this point, but it's an order of magnitude larger than the, the rates of awareness in the OR. Uh, to, moving on from that meta-analysis to a more specific study, so the ED awareness study is where I shared that uh, initial quote from. So this was done um, in the last couple of years at the uh, University of Washington in St. Louis. So they, they took um, all the patients who were intubated um, in their facility over a year, and um, they... After excluding patients with like neuro injuries and kind of kind of other uh, inappropriate populations, they went back and they interviewed the patients, reviewed the cases, and found that 2.6% of the patients had possible or definite awareness with paralysis. And they also found that these patients had higher threat perception scores, which are a risk factor or have been correlated with development of PTSD. Um, and then looking at the factors that were different between these patients and kind of every, everyone else who got intubated and didn't wear weren't aware of paralysis, Rocky Ronin was a huge risk factor for that. Um, and then a really scary number we see here is if we extrapolate, if, you know, if we say this 2.6% is the true number, which, you know, again, we don't know that this, this one single set study doesn't prove that, but if this is the true rate, um, extending it to all intubated ED patients implies that there are more than 6,000 cases of awareness with paralysis um, with our intubated ED patients every year. Um, and it may even be lower than that because um, only 35% of patients in the study who were intubated received rocuronium. I know at, at our shop, University of uh, Wisconsin, it's much more common to use rocuronium than any other agent for paralysis. So we're at risk for having much higher rates. Now let's move on to some critical care literature and actually a landmark study. So the reevaluation of systemic early neuromuscular blockade or the ROSE trial so th this is a really important critical care study looking at um, par paralysis of patients in ARDS. Um, but as part of the study, as one of, one of their um, secondary sub-outcomes, um, they looked at awareness of paralysis and they reported it out and in the intervention group, it was 1.8%. 1, 1. And then for some reason, some of the control group also got paralyzed at points. Um, and 1.6% of them had awareness of with paralysis. But what's really interesting is how did the trial report this? How did the trial talk about this? This, is, this isn't the main outcome of the trial, but it, it was one thing they, they th thought enough, enough to record. Um, and it was categorized as a non-serious adverse event. And then the, the analysis in the paper was, recall paralysis was uncommon and did not differ between groups. Now, this 1.8% 
is pretty high. And it's actually not so different than the estimates we see from the meta-analysis or that ED study. Um, but I'm not sure I call 1.8% uncommon. Um, so I think we need to kind of challenge the complacency we have around awareness with paralysis, and we need to work to prevent it. Um, we don't have amazing evidence at this point about the best ways to prevent awareness with paralysis, particularly in the ED and ICU setting, but kind of the preliminary recommendations we can make at this time are we should avoid neuromus neuromuscular blockade when able, when able. You know, if patients aren't paralyzed, when they're not paralyzed, they can't have awareness of paralysis. And then also, particularly in the context of intubation, you know, this is a reason to, you know, a little bit of pause, a little bit of thought about using rocuronium versus succinylcholine. Um, protoclast sedation could be helpful. And then the final thing is potentially bispectral index monitoring or BIS monitoring. I put an asterisk on this because there's probably reasonable evidence for this in the OR setting, but there isn't any evidence that's been done to show effectiveness for preventing awareness with paralysis in the um, ED or ICU. And then even in the OR setting, it's not been shown to be more helpful than um, ex exhaled gas monitoring, which is obviously not something that we have access to. But um, And then I also want to make a quick note on sedation. And this, this is probably pretty elementary for everyone who's interested, who's in critical care, interested in critical care. But, you know, light sedation is generally a good thing for patients. And we, ex we usually want to have people able to have memory and recall of events while they're on mechanical ventilation. We don't want to just snow them and give them all the complications associated with that. But when a patient is paralyzed, that's when our rascal or whatever um, depth of sedation we're monitoring, that's when that change needs to be much deeper because it's, it's very harmful as we've discussed here. So um, these are my references. And then I, this is a slide I want to leave you to see though. So here's, here's those thousand dots again. And if we assume that 3.4% number from the meta-analysis of the good quality studies is representing the true rate of awareness with paralysis, here are 34 of those thousand dots um, circled. So imagine your next thousand intubated patients and 34 of them being aware of being paralyzed. Thank you. Awesome. Dr. Sample, that was an excellent talk on a, on a really important topic. And I think you uh, kind of hit the nail on the head that we need to worry about what are the long-term consequences when stuff like this happens. And uh, when you read those quotes from the ED awareness study, they are, they're pretty brutal to, to look at and read and consider going through yourself. So does that, first I want to open the floor up to any questions and see if, if anyone else has any questions before I ask my own questions. That's all right. I'll get the ball rolling. So, you know, especially given that we're going to talk about this later and what your particular interests are uh, in in uh, in critical care flight medicine, I'm curious what your thoughts are about how you um, approach preventing paralysis with awareness while you're transporting a patient who is critically ill. Well, you know, it definitely poses a lot of challenges. Like w whenever you're getting out of the hospital and ha having those the few resources on the helicopter or, or in, the, in the back of an ambulance, um, it, 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 it can be tricky to kind of remember this because there's, there's so many other things you're trying to do with keep the patient alive. But um, that aspect of kind of a protocolized approach to sedation to remembering, okay, like every, this every so often we need to be redosing our midazolam or our ketamine. And ketamine is often help, helpful in these settings for, for a lot of these hypotensive trauma patients that we're, we're bringing in from the field. Um, and you know, it, it, it has to become part of our checklist, part, part, part of our reviewing the vitals, thinking about things like, okay, when did we last dose this patient who's paralyzed? And then also when possible of avoiding paralysis of these patients, so. Yeah, it's a good. That's a good point. And so you you prefer boluses as opposed to drips in transport. We we, we usually have limited um, line access and pumps available, so it 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 it, it it's often easier to be to be doing boluses. Yes. Sure. That's probably something most of us who spend most of our time in institutions don't think about all that often, um, but it's something we probably need to think about. Um, and then I'm also just wondering, it's since this is like common. Um, how should we approach the decision to paralyze um, to paralyze a patient? You know, both for intubation and how we're going to sedate them, and if they are in uh, ARDS and they need paralysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So, you know, I, I, I think it's, this is another part of the decision-making process. I, I think in the past, we've really glossed over this as a potential risk factor or harm of paralysis. And, you know, as we know, the, the evidence for paralysis in terms of improving patient outcomes in terms of ARDS is not amazing, especially with the ROSE trial. Um, so we have to give serious consideration. Are we you know, paralyzing the patient just to make the numbers look better and make us feel better, even though we don't necessarily know that's going to improve the chance of getting off the vent. Um, but it, 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 it comes down to rain, weighing those risks and benefits in, in the situation. And then when we are going to paralyze, um, approach, approaching it in a protocolized way, and, and kind, of, kind of like having all of our checklists like when, when we're proning patients and such, like all these things that we need to get done and, and doing appropriate sedation. Um, but yeah, re 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 really coming back to, to seriously considering those risks and benefits and making sure on the risk side of the ledger, we're considering awareness of paralysis. So really, really keeping it in the forefront of our minds as we, as we think about um, paralyzing someone to make sure it's not something that we forget about and put them through this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that talk. I think this is a, uh, like I said, a really important topic. And, and as we deal, you know, see patients and look at them long-term from the ICU, uh, dealing with their post uh, their post ICU course and their changes in mental status and the PTSD and anxiety and their post intubation or their post ICU care syndrome. Um, I think this is a, a super important topic and something we need to pay attention to. I really I really appreciate this talk and congratulations on uh, getting married. Uh, I hope you're enjoying Jordan. Um, awesome. Does anyone else have any questions before we move on to our next uh, speaker? I have one. Is that allowed? Yeah. <laughs> I also amazing that you're doing this from Jordan. Congratulations and great work. I, I, I think there's probably two things that are worth discussing, um, which is, you know, how do we avoid awareness in the two groups of people, people that we really have to paralyze? And I think, you know, one big place where this comes up is that we've almost all moved to using rocuronium for induction and that means we often use a short acting sedative and a long acting paralytic, as you say, right? So we give automate, which lasts, you know, depending on 20 ish minutes and rock, which lasts about an hour. And so we have 40 minutes uncovered. And so what are we mm -hmm. gonna do in those 40 minutes? And then the other thing is that in, you know, in our ARDS patients or our respiratory failure patients, those patients who are genuinely failing ventilation and require paralysis for ventilation or oxygenation, and there is no other option. I think being thoughtful about the sedation that we're gonna use in those patients that we really do need to use the muscular blockade on is really important. Um, and I think you're hundred percent right, we shouldn't take it lightly. And there are actually, you know, a lot of, a lot of downsides to neuromuscular blockade, but some of our patients require it um, and we can't ventilate them without it. So certainly being thoughtful about our sedation and it being adequate. And I don't, I don't know about the others of you, but it is actually pretty hard to assess the sedation level on someone who has neuromuscular blockade, right? We're often using heart rate, um, which is actually not a reliable predictor. Um, and I often lean on my anesthesia colleagues um, to answer this exact question clinically. Um, I know some institutions use fist monitoring um, and there's other things people lean on, but this is actually something that comes up all the time, right? Like how do we make sure that our patients who require neuromuscular blockade are adequately sedated? Mm -hmm. um, so again, thank you. Really, really good. So thank you. Doing. Awesome. Dr. Gordon, those are, those are awesome comments. Um, and I think probably a lot of us had, had similar thoughts. So I appreciate you, you bringing that stuff up. Um, if no one has any other questions, we're going to move on to our next talk from uh, Dr. Lin about target temperature management. And one, uh, one quick thing, just so everyone pay attention, at the end of this, we're going to uh, have a vote to announce a winner for uh, kind of who we thought gave the, the best talks. All right. Thanks. All right, hold on one second. I'm trying to share like a part of my screen instead of just the entire screen.
I'm sure you already know this, but under advanced screen share, then you can click portion of screen, Andrew. And then I'm assuming you want to show your PowerPoint slides, but not your notes. I do. Um, I'm okay. just looking for that advanced share screen. So button. hit share screen. And then across the top, you'll see basic, advanced, and files. Okay. I, and then I click advanced. And then you'll see portion of screen, which is the second choice from the left. I actually only see entire screen and window, which is unusual. Um, you know, is I'm, it, it is weird. Uh, um, let me just share my whole screen and we will just go with it. Okay. Sorry, I'm not more tech sad. No, no, not at all. Thanks for your help. I really appreciate it. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so, hey guys, good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew. Uh, I am a EM resident at uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, I'm doing this meeting to you guys from Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, actually, uh, the backdrop behind me is exposed brick, which is actually very typical of Baltimore row homes. If you guys ever rent here and you rent one of these row homes, you'll get this great backdrop to do all of your meetings. And so um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about TTM. You know, I think it's the perfect cross section between emergency medicine and also critical care medicine. And I want to start with this letter in a resuscitation um, with actually one of our graduates, Dr. Carr. And he asked basically uh, a lot of faculty in his emergency department, you know, if you're doing TTM in your post cardiac arrest patients, why are you or why aren't you? And there was a lot of heterogeneity between why they weren't you know, sort of some confusion over the literature, thinking, you know, maybe TTM doesn't work. What temperature do we set it at? Do we still use TTM in people with shockable rhythms? There's sort of a lack of consensus. And this also mirrors my experience at my institution between, you know, what temperatures do we cool these patients at and if we start them at all? So I thought it was a great topic just sort of to go over with. And of course, later we'll discuss a little bit about the literature and sort of hot off the press, the new, new TTM2 trial by Nielsen. So just a little bit about objectives. We'll just talk a little bit about TTM, talk about the clinical implications and the literature, especially the new literature. And of course, this is important in a lot of people we get back, both in the emergency department um, and in the ICU, of course, they've had a bunch of this hypoxic brain injury. And so only 8.2% of people with outside hospital cardiac arrest actually have intact neurologic function. So it becomes, it becomes really important to be sort of able to attenuate this hypoxic brain injury. And when we're talking about TTM, you know, we're talking about, you know, large hypoxic brain injury. We're talking about a lot of glutamate, we're talking about free radicals, we're talking about um, post-arrest pyrexia causing increased neurologic injury and sort of poor neurologic outcomes. And so the sort of outcomes that we care about way beyond ROSC or how they do in the ICU is what does their neurologic outcome look like 30, 60 days, 90 days down the road? Like, are they very disabled? Are they able to perform their ADLs? We, these become really important endpoints toward you know, how we handle and how we perceive resuscitation um, even beyond the emergency department. And so the way I like to think about TTM is always in sort of this post-cardiac arrest bundle. Um, once we get a patient back in the emergency department, we're thinking about a lot of things. You know, we're thinking about you know, what caused their arrest? What kind of interventions do we need to do? We're thinking about putting in lines, you know, we're doing echoes and fast exams. We're asking ourselves, do we need to cath this patient? Do they know, need to go up to the cardiac catheterization lab now? And in doing all of these things, optimizing all of these organ systems, we're trying to set the brain up for neurologic recovery. We're asking ourselves, how can we optimize all these symptom, uh, systems so we can have a good neurologic outcome? And I think at the cornerstone of optimizing these neurologic outcomes, is targeted temperature management. And this idea that cooling these patients after cardiac arrest will sort of decrease the amount of neurologic injury we see post-arrest and lead toward better neurologic outcomes. 
And so how do we do it? This is just a brief primer. Of course, this varies from institution to institution. We know that starting as soon as possible after arrest in the right patient population pretends to better outcomes. We cool anywhere from 33 to 36 degrees, which is something I'll talk about in a bit. We avoid fever, we're scheduling Tylenol, we're still you know, investigating what caused the cardiac arrest and we're preventing shivering. Um, and all of this to sort of improve their neurologic um, outcomes after the rest. And so we could spend, I think, a lot of time talking about each of these studies, um, right? Be beginning with the Bernard study and going on with the TTM1 studies, uh, as well as the Hyperion study. Um, it really all started in 2002. You know, we had these, these sort of landmark studies uh, that were kind of quasi-randomized that showed uh, improvement in neurologic outcome, and in some cases in mortality, in TTM versus no TTM. And so at this point, the ILCOR and AHA said, oh, this should be probably standard of care for post-cardiac arrest. And then of course, in 2013, we had this great study, right, TTM1, um, that compared two endpoints of TTM, normothermia, 36 and 33, mostly in shockable arrest, and they found no differences. So at this point, there became, I think, a lot of controversy in both the EM and the critical care um, sort of community that said, do we really need to cool these patients very aggressively? Do we need to target hypothermia? Can't we just prevent fever? And then later on in the Hyperion study, um, another study that actually looked in non-shockable rest, we saw TTM 33 versus 37, and they did, in fact, find a difference in neurologic outcome. And so kind of to summarize what I just talked about, um, we can talk for, I think, a long time about, you know, methodologic differences and limitations and that sort of thing. Uh, but we found, you know, essentially a difference in the Bernard and the Hawkes trials in 2002. Uh, we found a difference in the Hyperion trial, but no differences in the TTM trial. Though all of these studies sort of measured sort of different targeted temperature goals. And of course, this is probably sort of the meat of the talk, right? In 2021, TTM2 came out. And this was a large, randomized, multi-center trial with almost 1,900 patients. And they measured um, outcomes between TTM33 and TTM36 to 37. And they looked at death and they looked at neurologic outcome at six months. And I think this is a great infograph to kind of demonstrate sort of the whole study. And they essentially found no difference. And so I think for a lot of people, this was sort of the last straw, right? You have this great methodologically sound study from Nielsen that showed that, you know, targeting hypothermia doesn't really change anything. And so I think a lot of us thought, you know, that we should probably not target hypothermia at all. And it was a really well done study, but in my mind, there's sort of one big caveat. And I've kind of outlined this caveat here. 80% of these patients received bystander CPR. 80% of patients had a shockable rhythm. And we're talking about ROSC less than 25 minutes. One minute to BLS, nine minutes to ACLS. And if you were, if you had an unwitnessed cardiac arrest, and you were in a systole, you just weren't included in the study. So it was an exclusion criteria. And so the question came to me, are these patients the type of patients I'm seeing in my inner city emergency department? So I, I you know, practice in Baltimore, Maryland, and most of, almost all of our patients are asystole or PEA, no bystander CPR, and usually unknown downtimes. And so they have this sort of large window of hypoxic injury. So, I, so the question was, could we generalize, you know, this study to the patients that we were seeing sort of in our inner city departments? And I'll show you two other trials, and these are more observational trials. This one was done out of Japan, and it looked at TTM 33 versus 36. But it also stratified these patients into moderate and high and low, excuse me, low to high sort of severity using something called the RCAS score, which takes everything from initial rhythm to downtime to bystander CPR, kind of graded them into 
how much hypoxic brain injury they had. And interestingly, almost no difference between those of low severity in both morbidity and in neurologic outcome. But then in these sicker patients, we're starting to see a little bit of difference in actual hypothermia. This was another study. This one was done out of Pittsburgh. Um, and these patients are graded similarly with RCAST with uh, something called a Pittsburgh cardiac arrest score. Severe being four, mild being two. And interestingly, in this study, what we're also seeing is therapeutic hypothermia seems to confer benefits in those who with more severe hypoxic brain injury. And kind of sort of where does that leave us? I think everyone falls sort of into two camps, right? There's the normothermia camp on the left, 36 degrees. There's the hypothermia camp on 30 degree, 30 degrees. We've had all these really great studies, including TTM2, which was very well done. But I suppose the question to me now is, is it time to really close the door to therapeutic hypothermia? And the question, the, the answer to that, I would say is it really depends. Can we generalize this new study to all patients? Is it possible that those with more severe anoxic brain injury could benefit from targeted hypothermia? I think the answer is possibly. And so what sort of I kind of gather from all this literature is that should we do TTM? We should. It's recommended by the AHA. We should avoid fever. Whether or not we should do normal and hypothermia, I think will depend on individualized department protocols. And it'll depend on the kind of patient population you're treating. But the exact temperature, and of course, the duration of TTM, especially with the new ice cap trial, I think those are still topics of debate. And I'm glad we can have this debate, this debate and talk about what essentially I think is something we're spending a lot of resources on in sort of resuscitating and improving the quality of our life, of life in our sickest patients. And lastly, I just wanted to share, this is our um, sort of post-cardiac arrest algorithm that we developed in 2020 um, and still stay, stands despite TTM. Um, we cool all patients to 33 and 34 degrees just because the majority of patients we see are sort of asystole, PEA. And of course they get this whole bundle of things including early vasopressors, early cooling, consideration for cardiac catheterization. This has been sort of a multidisciplinary kind of effort across the institution to be able to standardize these kind of, this kind of post-arrest care in our ED. Here are my references. And of course, I'd like to thank um, Romer G. O'Kaden, who is a neurointensivist here at Hopkins. Um, uh, that's also the PI for ISCAP. Dr. Dan Swedeen, which is uh, uh, the ISCAP PI in the ED. And also on the left, um, Dr. Benjamin Avela, who heads the TTM Academy at Penn. Um, all of these great ideas. Uh, yeah. Questions? Okay, I've got a... Oh, go ahead. So I'm curious with, you know, since, since it seems like the benefit may be limited to patients who have asystole or PEA, and then, you know, we're not really sure what the number needed to treat would be at this point. Um, what, what kind of a number needed to treat in this like limited patient population do you think would be necessary to make this intervention kind of worthwhile kind of across other sites that don't necessarily see all PEA and asystole? Um, I, well, I, I would say if you are sort of at a center that doesn't, you know, see just a very large amount of PA asystole, maybe you have a mix um, of people who present with shockable rhythms, good bystander CPR. If that's your patient population, I feel like at that point, um, the TTM2 trial and the TTM trial is well generalizable. And I think normothermia would be actually the answer. Um, with the number needed to treat, I think, I think that's a difficult question um, because the patients I think that might benefit, might benefit more from hypothermia tend to be those who are very, very sick and who might have sort of poor prognosis um, sort of from the beginning. Um, I guess what I'm saying is sort of maybe not a one size fits all sort of approach to all patients, depending of course on 
your institutional protocol and your patient population. Sure. Yeah. No, I, 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 you make really good points there. I, I just start to wonder a little bit with, um, you know, in, in, in centers that do have mixed patient populations where you have some coming in with like good bystander CPR and chocolate rhythms and some that are not, if, you know, j- just for sake of argument, if it's, if number needed treats a hundred, if we, if we need a hundred patients who come in with asystole or PA to get targeted, you know, like actual cooling to like 33 to have outcomes, improved outcomes, is it worth maintaining the infrastructure of, um, cooling patients, all, all the equipment supplies and the potential um, harms of cooling. That's what I start to wonder, but. Okay, I, I mean, I, that's, a, that's a fair statement. Um, I, I think it depends um, your, on how flexible your protocol can be. Um, because of course, instituting just a one size fits all protocol is logistically, um, it's logistically a little easier. With that, uh, with that being said, I'm wondering um, if you have any thoughts on, you know, since a lot of us have moved away from this, maybe you have some ideas on what the best ways to incorporate a TTM protocol or protocolizing this care into the emergency department is. Now, since we're talking about doing not a one size fits all, maybe there's some, some discussion about who the best candidates are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the best way to do it is, of course, being very in t- involved with your ICUs, with your intensivists. Um, the way we've kind of approached this is when a patient comes to the ED and they are a candidate for targeted temperature management, how do we expedite getting cooling on immediately and where do they end up in terms of disposition? Um, and so how we've kind of managed that is involving all of our intensivists, including our MICU um, and our NCCU. Um, and sort of getting them on early um, and asking like, hey, do we do we and should we call this patient um, at this time? And the way it sort of works at our institution right now is when we get a patient back from arrest, there's sort of a pager, like a TTM pager that goes off and it sort of calls in sort of the NCCU fellow as well as sort of the MICU triage resident. They come down, we initiate cooling and we get the patient where they need to be. Awesome. I, I really appreciate that. It's uh, it's nice to hear another perspective. I think a lot of us have moved away from cooling and, and mostly to normothermia in uh, in the post arrest setting. So it's good to hear from uh, another perspective on that. Since I think things may move in the other direction, but hopefully this will maybe there's something there for us to look at more closely. I really appreciate that. Thanks. That was a great talk. Next up, we have Dr. Uh, Brian Frody giving us the pro- pragmatic hepatic schematic which is a mouthful. Yeah, bunch of rhymes for hepatic. Okay, so I'm gonna try the advanced screen share here. Let's see if I can get that. Okay, that's coming through okay. So, um, hi everyone. I'm a third year uh, emergency medicine resident at Albany here to talk about acute liver failure and hopefully to leave you guys with a plan to use uh, when uh, livers get really dramatic on you here. So, my um, first slide is what is liver failure? So, uh, sudden severe injury um, and dysfunction of the liver typically characterized by the development of hepatic encephalopathy, as well as a coagulopathy. And um, some causes for acute liver in, liver failure in the United States. Um, most commonly is due to Tylenol, but other causes, a uh, significant portion are other drug induced causes. So when you think about acute liver failure, top of your list should be Tylenol as well as taking a look through other medications. So what does it look like clinically? So it may present a little bit like Homer Simpson here. Um, you're going to have a guy that, or, uh, someone in their mid thirties, uh, that presents confused, can be jaundiced, however, Jaundice can be delayed, especially in hyperacute cases. Uh, They can also present agitated. 
and will be followed by the development of encephalopathy and coagulopathy. So what are some important history and physical elements to uh, talk about during your assessment of the patient? Going through their medication list and especially asking about any Tylenol use, because that's gonna be the majority of your cases. Asking about any prior history of liver disease or any prior history of hepatitis. Taking a detailed social history, including injection drug use, alcohol use, any other substance use, and a detailed travel history. So this is an image of Tylenol toxicity, um, and uh, about a third to a half of these cases occur due to efforts of pain relief, so they may be late to present to care. Um, but the good news is that uh, N-acetylcysteine or NAC is best initiated within the first 10 hours, but it can still be a value up to 72 hours after ingestion. So what's your initial evaluation and testing? I think it can kind of be broken down into three different uh, basic categories. So your basic lab testing, your CBC, your BMP, your LFTs, lactate. Um, then moving on to your viral and infectious testing. That's gonna include your HIV, HSV, hepatitis serologies, as well as evaluation for any underlying infection on top of their acute liver failure. And then additionally obtaining some miscellaneous testing, such as your tox panel, Tylenol level, um, pregnancy testing, autoimmune serologies, all those different um, testing as well. So this is just an image showing the multiple different effects that acute liver failure can have on your body. And I'm hoping to break it down into a organ systems based approach to the management of these patients. So first off, cardiovascularly, um, initially the cardiac output would be elevated, but can be decreased. Uh, your systemic vascular resistance will be decreased and will lead to tissue hypoxia. So this can obviously mimic sepsis or a distributive shock picture. So the first thing you wanna do is correct hypovolemia and volume expand. The next step is to use uh, norepinephrine as your uh, vasopressor if there's any persistent hypotension. And if you still have persistent hypotension, treating any underlying adrenal insufficiency, which is very commonly occurring with acute liver failure. Respiratory wise, a lot of these patients will develop ARDS up to 40%. Typically this happens much later in the course. It may not happen in the ED, um, but intubation may be required in the ED either due to respiratory failure or lack of airway protection due to their mental status. Um, in these patients, you're gonna wanna perform a uh, rapid sequence intubation with a neuroprotective strategy, avoiding hypotension, hypoxia, avoiding multiple attempts any prolonged apnea, and then considering pre-medication with fentanyl as well. And renal-wise, a lot of these patients will have coexisting AKI due to acute tubular necrosis, sepsis, drug toxicities. Tylenol can cause um, direct toxicity potentially through NAPQI. Um, they'll develop multiple electrolyte abnormalities as seen here. So they're going to require some frequent monitoring of the electrolytes. Um, gradual sodium correction uh, for any hyponatremia, frequent and reoccurring blood glucose monitoring, um, and they may require dextrose infusions uh, in their fluids to keep their glucose level up. And despite all of your best efforts, um, almost 30% of these patients will require some form of renal replacement therapy. And um, while these patients are awaiting renal replacement therapy, you may potentially have to start um, sodium bicarbonate for any refractory acidosis prior to initiation of renal replacement therapy. Neurologically, another key feature and complication of acute liver failure is the development of cerebral edema, hepatic encephalopathy, and developing increased intracranial pressure. Um, these patients require frequent and close neuromonitoring reexamination for all, all of these complications. Um, there are several possible things you can do to help prevent this. Uh, first off, the easiest thing is just elevating the head of the bed, aggressively treating any underlying fever and uh, measurement of the ammonia level as well to help predict the development of hepatic encephalopathy and cerebral edema. 
And if there is um, underlying cerebral edema and increased intracranial pressure, you can consider mannitol as well as hypertonic saline for treatment of those. Infectious disease-wise, infection and sepsis are very commonly co-occurring, and it may be difficult to differentiate the different pathophysiology since they can look so similar. So obtaining infectious testing and then having a very low threshold for initiating antibiotics in these patients. They're gonna have multiple coagulation abnormalities uh, as seen here. And although they may have multiple abnormalities in their testing, clinically significant bleeding events are rare and more likely there's a balanced deficit between bleeding and thrombosis. Only administer blood products for any active bleeding for the patient or prior to invasive procedures. And you're gonna to want to start these patients on a prophylaxis with proton pump inhibitors or uh, H2 receptor antagonists. So another big cause is the drug-induced toxins. These are some of the potential culprit medications among many others. The good news is that the NIH uh, has a whole database of different medications um, that can potentially cause liver injury and has a likelihood of scoring for each of these medications based on case reports and case series and pathology. Another thing to consider is the viral induced causes. Um, in the US, these are much more rare, but internationally, viral causes are more common. Um, hepatitis A, B, HSV, and CMV being more common ones. And uh, if this is identified, consider starting antiviral medications. So a uh, big potential treatment option for these patients is liver transplant. Their survival is approximately 79% at one year, which is lower than chronic uh, liver disease transplants. But overall, these patients have a better longer term survival, potentially due to less uh, medical comorbidities as well. Um, so determining who should go for liver transplant involves careful identification of who will likely die without a transplant those who will recover with just supportive care and identifying those patients who are too sick to receive a transplant due to uncontrolled infection, brain herniation, other organ failure um, that would preclude them from transplant. So this is an image of King's College um, where one of the initial models, the King's College criteria came out for acute liver failure, both for Tylenol as well as non-Tylenol acute liver failure. Um, these models, uh, especially the King's College criteria, are more specific than they are sensitive. So um, they can't identify patients that will have poor outcomes with transplant, but just because a patient does not um, meet King's College criteria doesn't mean that they wouldn't benefit from transplant. So uh, big things to know are that the key, develop key indicators for many of these models are the development of encephalopathy or coagulopathy and to discuss these patients with the liver transplant specialists prior to um, uh, you know, considering them for transplant. So I'll open it up to any questions here. Brian, that was a great talk. Thanks a lot. I think it's so great to break it up into organ systems so you can uh, really think through those patients the way we often do in an ICU about those different things and, and get a better sense of, of what's going on and how to manage it. Uh, I, as always, have questions, but if anyone else has any other questions and wants to jump in first, please do. I, I have a question for you. I, so I work yeah. at a non-transplant center in the ED and the ICU. And I guess the question I always ask, I, or I always think in my mind, I get these calls from outside facilities to transfer into my non-transplant center. When do you think um, maybe from the ED directly or uh, a patient should be referred to a transplant center and not go to their closest tertiary care uh, center? Yeah. How do you make that decision? So that is actually what prompted me to create this presentation because I had a patient in acute liver failure. Um, and I think uh, early involvement and consideration in transplant and getting them to the resources that they need, um, it's very complex. And I think if you have any concerns at all, um, getting on the phone with the you know, transferring facility and talking with the transplant surgeon um, or you know, the critical care physician, um, is a great idea. Obviously, if they meet like the King's College criteria, you can have a pretty high confidence that they're going to um, have a poor outcome without transplant. 
And that's something that I would definitely, um, you know, consider very early on in their care. Um, patient I took care of, I actually reached out, I was on my community rotation, reached out to um, the nearest liver transplant facility and actually sent them uh, three hours away to the nearest liver transplant facility. So, and it was an ongoing discussion with the transplant surgeon about his labs, you know, what was potentially causing this and everything. And um, big things like asking their social situation and things that I may not have, you know, initially been focused on, but like what level of social support do they have? You know, do they have insurance? What's their job? And I was like, I don't, I don't didn't ask them all those details initially, but um, so those may be questions that will be fielded to you. Yeah, that, that's a great point. When uh, in fellowship, we frequently would get uh, transfers for uh, for evaluation for liver transplant, and oftentimes the biggest barrier that they had to transplant was social situation. And uh, we eventually started pushing our transplant docs to start asking those questions before we brought them, because otherwise they would just sit in our unit. Um, I. Does anyone else have any other questions? Awesome, Brian, I think that was a, a great talk and a super important topic. We're running a little behind, so I'm gonna kind of move along and we're gonna jump to the next lecture, if that's okay with everyone, uh, from uh, Matt Carvey regarding uh, critical care, uh, curbside critical care and retrieval medicine. Hey guys, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here really quick. If I can drag it down, there we go. All right, so thank you very much, Dr. Gordon. Uh, as you said, my name is Matt. Um, in my previous life, I was actually a flight and tactical paramedic for over four years, um, and then just recently graduated from St. George's University. So as my buddy would say, we're currently in the match matrix, waiting to see where our home is gonna be for the next three or four years. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and shut off my video here just so it's not distracting you, just because I'm very active when I like to present. So you don't need that distraction while I'm presenting. Um, but yeah, ever since I was a flight and tactical paramedic, a lot of the, um, I guess, frustrations that I had really stemmed from, you know, we knew what we needed to do on a scene for a patient, but we didn't have that resource available to us in the pre-hospital environment. Um, and that was because we found the intervention was siloed in the hospital somewhere, siloed in the ICU, siloed in the ER, and we needed to bring the patient to that intervention in order to save their life. Um, and that's where the frequent frustrations came from. And uh, that's what I'm very interested in kind of going forward with into residency here. So that's why I call it curbside critical care and retrieval medicine. So here's kind of what we'll cover here, just a brief uh, introduction to everything. But I always like to start with an intro case because uh, I'm a paramedic at heart still, and uh, we always start things with intro cases. So we'll get started here with this one. So a call comes into the ER from a BLS team for a 58 year old male who had a witnessed cardiac arrest suspected to be from an acute MI just outside of a major metro area. Surprisingly, there's bystander CPR ongoing uh, within five minutes of arrest, which usually never happens. However, ALS was also dispatched and they intubated the patient and ultimately or achieved ROSC. Um, and this was after a persistent V-fib on the monitor. So they're approximately 20 minutes from the nearest cardiac center and the patient is waxing and waning hemodynamically. So what is retrieval medicine? Retrieval medicine is basically a term used to indicate the use for an expert team, which assesses, stabilizes, and transports patients with severe injury or critical illness. Great, like I guess good examples of that in the US here would be uh, pediatric and neonatal critical care transport teams, or where we're sending EM physicians, intensivists, or critically care trained paramedics and nurses to either a facility or a scene where a patient may need like a higher level of care um, that isn't really offered by that local community. So big differences between pre-hospital and retrieval medicine, which a lot of people don't understand, is that pre-hospital medicine really broadly focuses on care. And this can be anywhere from an urban, rural, or remote setting where they utilize protocols to kind of guide them in their treatment plans. And they have also have the guidance of a physician if needed. And this is really a scoop and run mentality. And what that means is that they're gonna grab that critically ill patient and they're gonna to run to the nearest tertiary care center where there's a higher level of care. Retrieval medicine is really a medical team from a specialist center um, that's sent to a healthcare facility or a scene, as mentioned, that can really go beyond the scope of practice of the typical pre-hospital interventions. 
And the scope of practice really widens um, to the fact that we can hopefully um, stabilize this patient's ailment. And this can include, you know, inserting transvenous pacemakers at sending facilities, mechanical ventilation, or specialized care for pediatric and pediatrics and neonatal uh, populations, as mentioned before. Um, but something I would really like to mention today, as we've uh, kind of said already, is this introduction of curbside critical care, which I kind of coined about three weeks ago when I was with my fiance. Um, and the reason, you know, why I kind of coined it this is because whenever we send a specialty team to us to either a center or to a scene, usually this falls under the scope of retrieval medicine. And that's kind of what curbside critical care really deviates towards as well. And that's because we're bringing in the resources typically found in an ER to the patient. And this can include anything from major traumas to medical emergencies that typically go out of the scope of practice of pre-hospital providers um, and all the interventions that we had mentioned before. But my question that always irked me when I was a flight medic is why aren't we bringing resources that are typically found in the ICU or interventions that go out of the scope of retrieval and pre-hospital medicine to the patient? Why are we always bringing the patient to uh, these tertiary care centers? And that's really where curbside critical care comes in. So when we explore this aspect of curbside critical care internationally, it's really bringing these critical care concepts to the patient here. And some specific examples I'm gonna explain on the next few slides here. So what we see here um, is actually a study and uh, practical use um, of something called ECMO in the streets of Paris. And Hewton et al. were actually in their article in GEM summarized the use of something called ECPR, or extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation on the streets of Paris. And this was really for the management of refractory out of hospital cardiac arrest of suspected reversible causes um, such as acute MIs or PEs or intoxicants that were actually reversible causes. And this is where their protocol really came in to start this pre-hospital ECMO program. Other things we can mention here is the use of Reboa. Um, Sadek et al. from their article in resuscitation actually summarized the use of this Reboa, resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta, to control catastrophic hemorrhage in the pre-hospital environment in London. And here we can see our very live patient, maybe plastic, still live, I think, um, where they're practicing the use of Reboa here in the pre-hospital environment. And lastly, um, a really good article by Vrusvik et al., um, in their article in the Air Medical Journal, actually explored the use of resuscitative thoracotomies and penetrating thoracic trauma in the Netherlands. Um, and this was specifically for a patient who was stabbed twice in the anterior thorax. They were actually acutely resuscitated and clamshelled to evacuate a clot in the pericardial sac. And she actually awoke three days later with really good neurologic function. And lastly, um, Australia, of course, has a very robust retrieval medicine and wilderness medicine, wilderness medicine approach that's really already been developed for them. That's very common to hear in, uh, in um, resuscitate or sorry, in retrieval medicine articles. So what are we doing here in the U.S.? So some examples of curbside critical care that we really do practice here in the U.S. Um, based out of the University of New Mexico, they've actually started a PECMO program a pre-hospital ECMO program, and they had their first cannulation actually in October of 2019, and it's successfully being run with a specific subset of patients um, and not very many patients in their actual subset. However, they are still practicing this PECMO program. And where the other mat is from University of Wisconsin is quite progressive actually with the use of pre-hospital POCUS to, a, to basically identify these massive PEs based on dilation of the right ventricle in the pre-hospital environment. It's actually guiding administration of thrombolytics pre-hospitally. So here's just a summary of kind of what we've already talked about. On the left-hand side, you can see the practices that are being explored currently where we talked about ECMO, Reboa, pre-hospital POCUS, and pre-hospital thoracotomies. But what else can we do? What else will fall under the umbrella of curbside critical care and not necessarily pre-hospital medicine or retrieval medicine? And this can include anywhere from, you know, transvenous pacemakers for significant bradycardia or persistent bradycardia in the pre-hospital environment. Not so much a sending facility, but doing this at the actual scene. Advanced airway procedures like fiber optics and tracheostomies when, you know, a crike or um, other RSI measures haven't worked. Um, decompressive burr holes or things like that for persistent ICP where a patient's posturing or has signs of Cushing's. And this can go on and on and on. And you know, considering critical care retrieval medicine and other areas that are very progressive, like space medicine or wilderness medicine or extreme environments, I'm interested in mountaineering. 
And, you know, I want to know, you know, if someone develops haste or high altitude cerebral edema is, is the best thing I can do for them is just bring them down the mountain. It seems kind of silly. So that's where these kind of practices may come in hopefully soon. And these are really the only two things we're doing in the U.S. right now. And the whole summary for this is basically relying on the fact that there needs to be further large-scale evidence-based research to firmly establish the role and usefulness of these interventions in the pre-hospital environment. Um, and this is likely an issue for, you know, the rest of these things that we're trying to explore as well. Um, it may be a reason why we're not doing Rebo in the U.S. Maybe a reason why we're not exploring pre-hospital thoracotomies at the scenes. And how about these other areas that we can explore as well? So some of the reasons why, why we might be roadblocked in pursuing curbside critical care here in the US, obviously these are very, very rare events, right? There's not enough evidence to support us considering these interventions when they only happen once a year or twice a year. Um, liability obviously is a huge thing in the US. Where does medical insurance come in? You know, that's what we always talk about here. Whereas we have global medical coverage in, in the majority of other countries in the US, we don't have that. Um, also, very stringent guidelines for these types of interventions. The PECMO program at the University of Mexico required high-performance EMS systems. They required inspired leadership and providers, physician field response programs that were already kind of set in place and a very close relationship with the EMS uh, system and receiving hospitals. As well, we need a large bystander reliance and support for you know, things such as CPR, which we usually don't get. Um, and then lastly, of course, cost is something we always have to mention as well. So coming back to that uh, case that we had started with, obviously we were trying to consider the uh, kind of protocol and use of uh, PECMO or pre-hospital ECMO. And here you can see it being uh, introduced here to a patient on the streets of Paris, specifically the subway station where they're instituting PECMO here. So in conclusion, basically pre-hospital medicine is a scoop and run mentality, whereas retrieval medicine introduces a stay and play mentality. Curbside critical care fits somewhere in between these two specialties with a little bit more deviance towards retrieval medicine. Curbside critical care is really meant to advance emergency medicine and critical care, bringing those siloed ICU interventions to the patient. We discussed some of the roadblocks that may disrupt some of the research that may be investigated. And then areas to be explored, of course, are currently um, in the U.S., maybe pre-hospital ECMO, Reboa, POCUS, and pre-hospital thoracotomies internationally. But what other ICU interventions can be brought to the patient? Here's my references, and thank you very much. Oh, that, was, that was great, man. Thanks so much. Uh, some of us are talking about bringing upstairs care downstairs, and you're like, forget it. Let's just bring it out the door. Uh, <laughs> Um, that, was, yeah. that was really neat. Does anyone have any questions about that? I guess I have more of a comment. I just, I wonder about using telemedicine for these things. I, I recently had a case, I was in the ICU and I went down to the tele EM box and just zoomed right in as the transport crew was trying to transport this really sick patient. And I was just thinking how awesome this is. I could zoom in on the vent. I could zoom in on their vital signs and just make recommendations by video remotely. And I just think that's a whole new world that we could really explore and, and increase the care with without having to put physicians in the field. I could just sit in my ICU call room and, and look at things from afar. Um, have you seen anything like that, Matt, or thought about uh, using tele uh, more in the field? I actually didn't really explore that. This was, I guess, more or less meant to be, I guess, a physician response system kind of in place. But telemedicine absolutely makes sense. I know here in Canada, we have a telemedicine approach where we have patients that have acute strokes or MIs and things like that at very far reaching facilities where they can telemed into a tertiary care center and get guidance on whether or not thrombolytics are kind of considered or whether or not they're sending them to another facility to actually get uh, cannulated and things like that. So love that approach, uh, Dr. Lenz. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a super interesting, uh, interesting thought. You know, they have like the stroke robots, maybe they have like a critical care robot that rides up next to the ambulance. Uh, hopefully there aren't too many potholes. Anyone else? Drone. I, I want to be a critical care drone. <laughs> <laughs> first, first you can get your organs, now you can get your critical care consults. Uh, does anyone else have any, uh, any questions or comments? Sure, I've got a question. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts about kind of the different structures of pre-hospital systems in different countries and how that contributes to um, being able to offer this um, critical curbside critical care. 
So obviously, you know, countries like the Netherlands or France have physicians in the field all the time. Here in the US, it's pretty uncommon. Like the University of Wisconsin flies physicians out on helicopters, but that's a very unusual model here in the United States. And kind of your thoughts of how to kind of overcome the challenges of most EMS systems not having physicians in the field, if that's more training for the, the critical care paramedics or like what, what the best way this might look like. Yeah, absolutely. So that was one of the pre-programmed, I guess, uh, questions that uh, Dr. Gordon was going to ask. But in the UK, exactly like you're saying, uh, Matt, it's, it's definitely a lot more progressive internationally than it is here in the US. Um, the UK actually has something called a merit pre-hospital career right now, which is really composed of an EM or a critically care trained physician and one trauma critical care paramedic. And, you know, they respond via helicopter by day, they respond by this crazy van during the nighttime, and, you know, they respond to all level one traumas in the area. Every single level one trauma that comes in, they automatically get dispatched to that on-scene uh, paramedic team. And, you know, the, this team was really created um, out of a response to a historically poor trauma outcome for patients in that area. And they're so well trusted now that basically, you know, when they arrive at that trauma center, that merit team arrives at the trauma center, they automatically just go to a CT scanner and decide what to do from there, whether it's surgery or whether or not it's some type of other level of care. And I think that you know, here in the US, um, and even in Canada, where I'm from, it's a really poor integration, I think, of EMS and critical care physicians onto the units, such as the approach that the UK uses with the merit system. And I honestly, I think it comes down to really the roadblocks that we had discussed, you know, what, what, what happens with liability here in the US, where we don't have a global system of health coverage, that we, as we find really in Europe and Canada, where it makes a little bit more sense um, from a liability perspective to approach it that way. Whereas here in the US, who really takes care of that patient, you know, when a physician goes out to the street, who's responsible for that patient? Is it the receiving facility? Is it the sending facility? Is it the paramedic crew? Who's responsible for them? You know, and it just comes down to insurance and liability as it always does, I think, here in the U.S., if that answers your question, Matt. Thank you. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Uh, what are your thoughts on like uh, pre-hospital, um, like the pre-hospital stroke ambulances that have the CT scanner with the neuroradiologist? I mean, that's some, you know, that's some critical care, kind of the same thing as the stroke robots in the, in the other hospitals. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we brought that out in Canada, actually, about and that must have been about eight years ago now, where we had a stroke ambulance brought out in a major trauma area, Calgary, Alberta, and they responded to a very minuscule amount of patients, you know, they had to meet a, such a stringent protocol that they were almost never really sent out. And so, you know, the use of you know, these, these stroke ambulances and things that have CT scanners in the back of them, they have all these like great interventions that they can do. It just does, it seems like everyone's playing the safe game, which is absolutely fine. But if we're going to utilize these interventions to their, you know, their threshold, then we really need to be able to rely on the evidence-based discussions that we've had, the research that is out there to support, you know, what we're doing for these patients and really bringing that critical care to the patient's bedside. Awesome. Well, does anyone else have any other questions? All right. I think that's a, that's a really great topic. I, thanks for that. And I think it's important too, especially with so many of us who are kind of younger, uh, who can think about how critical care and the world of medicine is going to change as we evolve and how we can make it better for ourselves and more importantly for patients um, in, in the future. So we have, uh, so I, Thanks for that. Last up, we have uh, David Leon talking about vasopressin in uh, hemorrhagic shock. I'm super excited to uh, hear this talk. And uh, so David, why don't you take it away? Sorry for that. Um, I'm actually in the same place as Andrew Lynn. Um, since we both got to do Hopkins. Um, so let me just start sharing my screen.
So our technical difficulties here. That's all right, as you're getting uh, set up, I just want to remind everyone that afterwards, uh, after these questions, we're going to have a poll for uh, for the top uh, the top lecturers and uh, the winner gets a prize. So stick around and make sure that uh, that you vote to help us pick that out. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I'll assume everyone can hear me. All right, so I'm David Leon, uh, PGY4 EM anesthesia here at Hopkins as well. Um, in lovely, lovely Baltimore. And I'm gonna be talking about vasopressin for trauma and hemorrhagic shock. Just some quick disclosures and moving right along into our topic at hand. Um, so hemorrhage and trauma, um, Leading cause of death in ages 45 and less is trauma currently, and it's the fourth leading cause of death overall. Of those trauma-related deaths, 40 to 45% are related to hemorrhagic uh, injury. And hemorrhagic injury is the leading preventable cause of trauma-related death. Um, a significant portion of these people who do die from hemorrhage die within either the pre-hospital setting or within the first hour of arrival um, to the hospital. Um, and a lot of the interventions we currently have are dedicated to bleeding control and hemostatic resuscitation. Um, and these have been shown to decrease hemorrhage um, mortality from hemorrhage, essentially. So current methods of improving outcomes in hemorrhage are kind of multifold. One is through bleeding control via damage control surgery. And this has always been the hallmark of of uh, trauma, um, but there are all other mechanisms that are starting to emerge, such as early recognition of shock physiology, catching patients that are hemorrhaging earlier on before they enter a decompensated shock state. Um, there's also the management and resuscitation of hemorrhagic shock through guided blood product administration and then also kind of guided rapid correction of coagulopathy. Um, we have different ways of doing this. Um, we have um, goal-directed bundles and trauma resuscitation that many hospitals have begun to implement, as well as um, recognition, recognition of shock physiology earlier on by focused on things such as shock index and other vital sign parameters. And then we have for guided correction of coagulopathy, we have such methods such as rapid tag and Rotem in which we can give um, products as needed rather than just bolusing fluids and giving um, kind of just generic bundle product. Um, Overall, as we know, um, we also have the classic idea of the lethal triad, which is now being kind of expanded the idea of the lethal diamond of hypothermia, coagulopathy, acidosis, and now hypocalcemia. Um, so the idea of resuscitating uh, trauma patients in hemorrhagic shock with calcium, either calcium gluconate or calcium chloride, once we've gotten more than four units of packed blood cells administered. So moving to kind of the meat of the topic for today, um, vasopressors in trauma, specifically we'll get to vasopressin in trauma. As you know, um, vasopressors in trauma are still a very controversial topic and currently not recommended by ATLS. Um, many of the earlier studies um, done mostly through trauma um, have shown an association between high vasopressor use and mortality um, or uh, non-survivorship. Um, however, many of these studies are kind of somewhat flawed in that they were retrospective studies in which um, much of the vasopressors used were used in patients that were already had increased severity of illness. And so there's a correlation of was the use of vasopressor in these patients uh, just a marker of their severity of illness rather than a direct com contributor to their adverse outcomes. Um, and um, in a lot of these studies, you see actually patients who receive vasopressors were typically older or more severely injured by it's decided by acute severity injury scales, um, had worse vital signs and increased mortality rate um, overall. Um, so 
some of the benefits we might see in vasopressors in trauma, particularly, is that um, with aggressive flu replacation, replacement instead of early vasopressor use, aggressive fluids can lead to pulmonary edema, endothelial leakage and disruption, and dilution of co uh, clotting factors, worsening coagulopathy. And there's benefits to early vasopressor use, such as um, fluid sparing, but also the idea of vasoconstriction, which can help cerebral and coronary perfusion pressure and decrease bleeding through vasoconstriction of the splanchic bed and undoing of vasoplegia. And in general, for patients that come in typically in shock states, such as a lot of trauma patients, especially older trauma patients, a lot of them are catecholamine depleted and might be in a vasoplegic state. So these patients might experience um, multiple benefits from getting early vasopressors, and in particular, vasopressin. Um, as in a lot of these early studies where increased mortality was associated to uh, vasopressor use in these trauma patients, the only one that was often shown to have no independent association with mortality was actually vasopressin. Um, the only one that had the, the highest correlation was actually epinephrine. So moving into the meat and potatoes of today's topic, vasopressin. So before we dive into and the studies related to its use in trauma. What is vasopressin? It's a neurohypophyseal uh, neuro peptide hormone that's created in a pro-hormone form. Um, and we actually can use a, one of the cleavage products from it, copeptin, um, which is from the C-terminal fragment of the AVP pre precursor to measure our endogenous vasopressin use. Um, but talking about vasopressin itself, what does it do? It binds several receptors. Um, amongst them, it binds the B1A, which is your vascular smooth muscle cells kind of throughout the whole system. Um, you have your V2 receptors, which are primarily in the efferent F, you know, arterials, uh, uh, smooth muscles there, as well as the collecting duct, um, helping with AD, uh, increasing um, aquaporin. So you have increased retention of uh, fluid there. And then you also have improved perfusion through vasoconstriction of the reefen, renal efferent arterials. Um, and then you have B1B, which stimulates ACTH release, which helps with improving your actually cortisol levels as well as your insulin levels. Um, things to know about uh, vasopressin, um, aside from this direct effect on arterials, it also has an indirect effect on um, increasing our sensitivity to circulating catecholamines. Um, so typically in the initial um, stages of hemorrhage and initial stages of hemorrhagic shock, we actually have an increased release, which is 20% to 25% of your endogenous stores of vasopressin can be released as a reaction to um, significant hemorrhage. Um, and uh, studies have shown that in states of hemorrhagic shock, um, our vasopressin stores are often depleted and low levels of vasopressin are correlated directly with vasoplegia and catecholamine resistance. Um, and uh, a low vasopressin level has actually been correlated with increased transfusion needs. Um, some earlier studies outside of trauma um, have shown that vasopressin in states of vasoplegic shock, not directly related to hemorrhage, um, have been useful um, in uh, reducing mortality and morbidity. The most uh, well-known study here is Banks trial, which actually is dealing with uh, vasoplegic shock states in cardiac patients. Um, and in the Banks trial, we saw that mortality and significant and severe adverse events in the vasopressin patients was actually lower than those patients uh, receiving norepinephrine. And in particular, they actually had decreased occurrence of AFib and, mor um, AFib and mortality without any difference in um, such events such as digital ischemia, mesoteric ischemia, hyponatremia, or MMI. So, bringing vasopressin into the realm of trauma, um, what does um, vasopressin do and that's particularly useful in trauma? It helps transfer blood from the skin, spleen, and skeletal layers to the heart and brain, thus helping mature the perfusion of vital organs. And it also restores blood to the kidney and liver, as well as decreases blood to mesenteric and portal blood flow. So this maximizes cerebral perfusion pressure as well as coronary perfusion pressure. Um, and also gonna reduce the amount of blood loss through any Injuries to the spine, like basically like abdominal, uh, blunt abdominal trauma, or even penetrating abdominal trauma. Um, early animal studies have shown that um, it, any interabdominal hemorrhagic choke um, actually have 
mortality benefit from this. And there have been several small studies in humans that have shown decreased fluid requirements in trauma patients that receive um, vasopressin. So moving on to kind of our well, most well-known study at the moment um, through JAMA surgery in 2019 was the um, AVERT um, trial um, in which they took trauma patients, primarily, um, um, primarily penetrating trauma patients um, through a single uh, level one trauma center, very limited uh, group of patients, a uh, randomized control study only involving 100 patients, especially split even uh, between the control group and the vasopressin group. And they looked at, um, as their primary outcome, the total volume of blood products administered within the first 48 hours of the patients arriving to, um, to their trauma center. And that included all blood products, include packed red blood cells, FFP, and platelets, but um, somewhat um, importantly, not cryoprecipitate. And patients that were ruled out of inclusion here included patients such as those with TBI, CAD, chronic renal insufficiency, those who received a thoracotomy in the ED, and those who were required CPR en route. Um, so pretty stringent exclusion criteria. Um, and they also ruled out any patients that got vasopressin before enrollment. Um, also another major exclusion criteria, um, major item to think about the structure of this study was that they um, only began administering vasopressin in bolus form um, and then started an infusion once they've had what they defined as uh, definitive hemorrhage control and administered at least six units of packed with blood cells. Um, so an important feature here um, that kind of opens it up for future studies. And again, this was just an adult trauma patient. So this is not pediatric patients or the elderly. Um, so overall, what were the findings of the study? Um, it was showed that overall um, low dose vasopressin, um, which was given as a four unit bolus on arrival, resulted in significantly less FFP, significantly less platelets, and significantly less cryoprecipitate, even though it wasn't powered to look at cryoprecipitate. And overall, this resulted in a lower um, volume, volume of overall blood products given without any increased complications. And in fact, they actually saw that while there was no effect on the overall complication rate, there was a decreased rate of um, DVTs in these patients thought to be perhaps a effect of decreased um, blood product given result in a decreased um, pro-inflammatory state from giving immunogenic blood, blood products. Um, now, one Im important thing, again, um, there was a difference seen in the amount of blood products um, in plaque or blood cells that the patient received almost um, half as much blood products as needed, but the p-value unfortunately was 0.08. So this small um, group of patients shows that in this kind of, if we had more powered study, perhaps we could see even an effect in packed red blood cells, which I think is what is everyone biggest focus in terms of reducing um, red blood cell transfusion necessities. So major um, limitations on the study. Again, it's a small study, it was predominantly male, predominantly penetrating trauma, more around 75% was penetrating trauma, and large amounts of crystalloid fluids were given in these patients within the first 48 hours. The median was around 10 liters um, per patient in the first 48 hours. And the vasopressin dosage was not standardized um, after the initial bolus. The um, vasopressin administration after the initial bolus was based on their hemodynamic stability, and so not much not as much on their need of potential blood products. And again, my, my uh, biggest caveats with the study, aside from being underpowered, was that vasopressin was not given early. It was given only once six units of packed red blood cells was transfused. So I think what are the next steps here? You know, this obviously opens up for a larger, more powered, well-powered study um, to try to see if we can get um, the a significant difference in terms of the red blood cell product usage, especially in the context of today in which we're running into many um, blood shortages. Um, some other items that can start in terms of use of vasopressin in trauma patients and specifically hemorrhagic shock is earlier implementation of vasopressin and hemorrhage before they've entered hemorrhagic shock, before they've hit that six unit of reds. 
and even importantly, maybe giving vasopressin in the pre-hospital environment, um, especially with some studies showing now trauma patients who receive um, whole blood transfusion outpatient have improvement in their SI. If we indicate these patients that are going to receive whole blood um, there in the pre-hospital environment, maybe they can also receive vasopressin with this whole blood to reduce their overall need of transfusion, the overall product requirement um, once they do get to the um, into the hospital and potentially the OR. Um, there's also the question of use of push dose rather than having this created a drip for these patients and perhaps even standardization of vasopressin implementation with massive transfusion protocols. Um, there's also the idea of once they are, um, once with labs are drawn, could they have a copeptin level drawn as a surrogate marker for their trauma server, severity because a low copeptin level would indicate low um, vasopressin levels and thus the potential risk of needing um, higher amounts of uh, transfusion products down the road, um, either in the OR or in the ED. Um, and then some other items as I brought up already, the idea of push dose vasopressin. And while I've been talking about vasopressin here, there are other analogs of vasopressin out there, specifically terlopressin and celopressin, which we don't have any um, any data on. So those would be other items for which to do additional studies on. And lastly, um, some other items of the idea of using vasopressin in TBI patients who are completely excluded from the study, um, being that vasopressin um, has shown to actually have um, not only improving cerebral perfusion pressure by um, uh, peripheral vasoconstriction, but it's actually shown that in um, some animal studies um, that vasopressin receptors in the brain um, help reduce with cerebral edema. Um, so in patients with TBI patients with perhaps concerns for increased ICP, vasopressin might be of benefit in these patients, but again, we don't have um, any data on this. Um, so overall, I know I'm probably running over a little bit of time and I apologize for this. Um, trauma patients with significant blood loss and hemorrhagic shocks have lower levels of endogenous vasopressin. Um, vasopressin has shown to improve vascular tones and blood pressure in patients experiencing shock in these facial plegia. Early implementation of vasopressin in these trauma patients in hemorrhage and hemorrhagic choke may result in an overall lower blood product requirement in FFP um, platelets, prior precipitate, and um, hopefully with better powered studies, um, packer blood cells. And then, um, as I've said here already, additional research in trauma, including hemorrhage and hemorrhagic shock showing powered for potential morbidity and mortality benefits, as well as the optimal timing and dosage for, vas for vasopressin, part of my voice and my vocal polyps, um, are kind of needed. Um, and overall, I want to point out that vasopressin is going to be reducing but not replacing blood product administration. Um, so that would be if we eventually get better powered studies. Again, this is not to re completely replace the idea of um, administering blood products but just reduce the overall um, total volume needed. Um, here are my references. And sorry that I rushed through that. And there are several items I probably missed along the way. Thank you for your time and attention. I know this is, we are now entering past an hour of Zoom lecture, which everyone loves. Um, and I'll take questions now. Awesome. David, thanks a lot. That um, That's a super important topic because I think oftentimes we're struggling with what do we do with patients' blood pressure while we're waiting for them to get blood if you don't have uh, a fridge or a cooler right next to you like some of us um, have or like I had during residency and fellowship. Um, so I don't have that now and it's always, always a tough question. Um, do you think that, or first I'll open it up to anyone else. Does anyone else have questions? Uh, I, have, I have two questions. Uh, my first question is, do you think um, you outlined a lot of specific things about vasopressin that make it um, an ideal agent or a good agent to use in this situation? Uh, do you think that other vasopressors would have a similar benefit? And two, uh, do you think that the unique thing, the unique uh, pathology of a coagulopathy of trauma 
that it would work as well with uh, where I think of it most often, which is a GI bleed, which is something I deal with a lot more often. Um, so I think it's effect on splanctic uh, vasoconstriction is a little stronger than some of the other vasopressors. So unlike specifically like intra-abdominal um, trauma, whether it be blunt or um, penetrating, vasopressin will give you the biggest bang for your buck there. Um, and I think vasopressin also serves kind of the safest margin um, in terms of use, especially in bolusing, um, because it has less effect um, on pulmonary, vas um, pulmonary uh, vasoconstriction. So it's really kind of neutral in terms of causing any, um, any pulmonary, uh, increased pulmonary pressures, uh, which would be a concern for a lot of these patients that are gonna get intubated or they have a tenuous um, pulmonary status. Um, and so minimizing any effects on, on pulmonary pressures is ideal. Additionally, um, vasopressin has probably reduced effect in terms of increasing um, increasing myocardial strain. Um, and if anything, it just provides some more, it helps uh, that supply demand component that um, the myocardial might be experiencing in the setting of hemorrhagic shock. Whereas something like epi or norepi with a little bit of dianotropy it provides could be causing additional stress. Um, so I don't, I think epinephrine has shown, epinephrine is probably the most harmful in terms of um, using, um, especially in a in bolus setting, you know, you have risk of tachyarrhythmias and then you have increased demand on the on the heart. Um, now, norepinephrine is only just coming in vogue as used as a push dose presser, um, but that's something that might be very much a potential um, other agent. Again, vasopressin kind of often use the most, kind of the safest margin of, of uh, of use um, compared to the other vasopressors. Um, and we won't even talk about dopamine. Dopamine in my mind's dead. Um, <laughs> um, sorry if there's any dopamine fans out there. But um, but I think, you know, norepinephrine would be the only one I, other one I would consider as a potential one that could be used as kind of a, you know, volume reducing agent um, in, in trauma. Yeah, sorry, great, that was great. long there. No, it's, it's a great talk. I, uh, I love vasopressin too, um, for, you know, many of the theoretical benefits, but I, I just in hearing this and wondering, are we just avoiding over resuscitation just because the blood pressure is, you know, more normal. So now in this post resuscitation phase, this inflammatory, as you're saying, catecholamine depleted state, are we just avoiding, you know, treating low blood pressure with further resuscitation? Is that the mechanism here? Or do you think it's something more special than that? Um, like specifically in hemorrhagic shock um, individuals, I think yes. it's with those folks, it's, it's that vasoplegia um, in which maybe they have increased capacitance because they're just are no, they're refractory to catecholamines at that point. Um, for what, you know, even if they're, you're providing them catecholamines, if they're resistant to it because um, they've been in an adrenergic state for a little while, we, and then eventually they get just supremely vasodilated dumping products into them you know, only marginally improves their, their pressures. I think we do run the risk of over resuscitation in that effect that eventually once they start becoming a little more responsive to catecholamines, they have all this additional volume and you get either, if they don't become hypertensive, they might be going third spacing all that volume into that vascular space, whether that be you know, in the pleural, pleural space. So they start having pulmonary edema and pleural effusions, whether that's in, you know, around the heart. So you have even some uh, pericardial effusions, um, perhaps even in a tamponade and ongoing hypotensions, it might be masking them being over resuscitated. And then you could also be concerned that, you know, some cerebral edema, um, though that's probably a little lower risk in, in these folks. Um, yeah, I can't say for certain. Uh, again, that kind of, that connection of low levels of, vaso, of vasopressin and vasoplegia, and then the kind of the correlation there with increased product requirements, um, all is kind of an area of investigation. I think that's ripe, ripe for additional research, but obviously it's gonna be a little tough. I think overall, any of these additional research, next points I brought up are gonna to be tough because 
enrolling trauma patients is a known difficulty um, just because, you know, they come in and it's always a question of consent. And, um, you know, outside of just this topic in general, trauma patient, getting trauma studies is, is, is tough. Yeah. All right, Dave, I really appreciate that. And everyone, I, I really appreciate you sticking with us through uh, through the whole night. And I think those were five really great lectures with a lot of great discussions to build off each. So I think um, Kathy now is going to put up a poll for us um, to vote for the best speaker. There are two awards, one for the best speaker, one for the second best speaker. The first prize is a $50 Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, style certificate. Uh, second prize is $25. So please go ahead and vote. And uh, I will let you guys know who won in a minute or so. Hello, this is Kathy from AAEM. I'm going to need, if your leadership has not voted, I do need you to vote. Make sure everyone who's on screen has voted. We do have a tie. So I do need you to make a decision. Kathy, do you wanna uh, share, those, uh, share those results with Skylar and I? Uh, I have to share them with everyone if I'm going to share. So, oh, okay. Kathy, you can vote too. Oh, I don't want to. I, no, I can't. I can't. Not bad on this time. This, these are all too good. I, I don't want to be responsible. I can't help but notice there's 17. How you would be the odd vote. Everyone has voted. Okay, um, let's go ahead and launch it. All right, well, uh, it looks like uh, we have definitely a clear winner uh, for first place, uh, Matt Harvey with uh, Curbside Critical Care. I guess, do you wanna open it again and we can, uh, we can vote on a second place? Um, I'd have to recreate it real quick. So um, give me two seconds to do that. Um, Dr. Lentz, you could talk about the upcoming critical care meeting if you'd like. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you all for coming to this. I, it's great to hear everybody's topics. Really interesting stuff. Great to see what different institutions are doing. It's awesome that there's an EM anesthesia residency. I think that's super cool. Um, but it's great to see you all and, and hear your, your talks. Um, please consider joining our section and uh, coming to our monthly section meeting. The next one, I put it in the chat. It's on February 3rd, 8 p.m. Eastern time. You can uh, hear different ways to get involved. Uh, we try to be an active section and do things like this. We'd love to have you all join and vote for the second best speaker, right? Kathy, this is the second best since we already established the best. Is that right? That is correct. Thank you, sir. And Matt right. can't win again. Yeah, so please don't vote for Dr. Carvey. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Carvey, you already won. Whoever did vote for Dr. Carvey, could you change your vote? Is that possible? No, I don't think that's possible. Uh-oh. Matt, did you vote for yourself? <laughs> no, I voted for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and launch. Yeah. Everybody's in? All right. Uh, Dr. Stanfill, um, awareness during paralysis. So I guess uh, when you get back from your honeymoon, you can, uh, you'll have a, a gift card waiting for you. Um, for, uh, for that, it would probably be helpful. Awesome. Thanks everyone so much for coming. It was awesome to have uh, all these different talks and, and learn what 
different people's thoughts and ideas and what they're doing. And uh, big thanks to Kathy. She's a uh, super, super organized. She really put this whole thing together, made sure everything ran appropriately, made, th made sure things worked, made sure that we were organized in terms of getting stuff done and all the speakers had their stuff put together. So uh, without her, this never would have happened. So a big thanks to her, a big thanks to the rest of the critical care medicine section uh, who helped us organize this. And a big thanks to our speakers and to all of you guys for showing up and participating. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a great night. Thanks for sticking with us. Please come to our meetings.